Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, Cold Call Success, Identifying Your Ideal Clients and Centers of Influence. My name is Andy Gluck and I'm on the marketing team here at Ledgery Partners. We're a Salesforce Silver Consulting Partner and also a Microsoft Dynamics CRM Gold Partner. For those of you that are unfamiliar with us, Ledgeview Partners helps businesses transform their approach to sales, marketing, and customer service by aligning those teams to focus on improving their customers' experience, but also providing management with metrics through technology to evaluate their success. For today's webinar, we're going to talk about how cold calling is not just a numbers game. If you do not have a strategy, you're going to be forced to make tremendous amount of calls to just get a tiny handful of appointments scheduled. If you don't know the profile of your absolute very best ideal clients in detail, you're just going to be making more calls than necessary before you stumble across that correct person. If, however, you know who needs you, when they need you, and what they need you for, but also how to bring a tremendous amount of value to this prospect quickly, the sky is going to be the limit for you. But before I turn things over to the cold call coach himself, I do want to mention that today's webinar is being recorded and it's going to be available on demand after the live session. All attendees are going to receive an email this shortly following the webinar today. That's going to have a link to access the presentation on demand. We do encourage you to share this with your team and network as well. To ensure the best audio quality today, we do have everyone on listen-only mode, but if you do have a question, please be sure to submit those in the question pane on the right-hand side of your GoToWebinar control panel. You'll see a little tab there for questions. We do have a lot to cover today, so we promise to follow up. Um, after the webinar, we'll open it up for questions. If we don't answer it right away, we will answer it before we leave today. All right, now it's time to introduce our presenter today, Paul Newberger. Paul is, as I said, the cold call coach. Paul created the cold call coach in April 2015, following his tenure as VP of Advancement at Marion College in Fond du Lac, Wisconsin, and his time as a financial advisor making cold calls himself. Paul will admit he was not an overnight sensation, but through the tenacity he had to try new things, he started to find techniques that resulted in fewer and fewer answers of no. Paul has worked with Fortune 500 companies, pro sports teams, clients in nearly a dozen states, and is also a frequent presenter to thousands of people. And today he's taking the time to talk to all of us and start us down the path of learning how to get in front of who we want, when we want, for whatever reason we want. So, with all that, I will turn it over to the cold call coach. Paul, thanks for joining us today. Hey, thank you, Andy. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for taking time out of your busy schedule to uh, to be here today. Honored to be here. Thank you to Ledgeview Partners for setting this up. Ledgeview has done wonders for my business and my clients, and I'm, I'm honored to be associated with such a great organization. So, one of the, the only thing that I can think of that's more challenging than cold calling is talking about cold calling in less than 45 minutes, especially when you like to jaw jab as much as I do. So, without further ado, we're going to get right on down to this. And like Andy said, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, anything that you want more clarity on, when I get passionate about something, I tend to talk really fast. So, if you need me to slow down or you weren't sure what we were just discussing, Obviously, feel free to direct any of those questions to Andy, and he'll be Johnny on the spot for us here today. So with all that being said, let's roll up our sleeves and get to work. When it comes to cold calling, I believe the secret to cold call success is not what you say, but who you say it to. It's not the message that you convey, but rather when you're conveying that message. So before we talk about the script, before we talk about how to be really suave on the phone and have the the best messaging possible I want to make sure that you're calling the right person at the right time for the right reason exactly as Andy said and once you have those issues taken care of and those aspects addressed it's amazing how well things start coming together when you think of cold calling you probably think of several movies I mean off the top of my head I think of Gordon Gecko on Wall Street, you think of Boiler Room, you think of Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross that was just on HBO last night and I don't care what I'm doing, I always make time to watch that one. But what they glorify are people that are coming up with really good scripts, people that are quick on their feet, people that are witty, people that are able to, uh, in the words of Tommy Boy, sell a ketchup popsicle to a woman in white gloves. And all I'm going to say is that is important, sure, but not as important as knowing when to, where to aim and not as important as knowing when to pull the trigger. So that's a long way of me introducing to you what I call the concept 
of an ideal client. Now, not every person is an ideal client. Not every organization is an ideal client. What makes them ideal is that they're the best case scenario, that they check all the boxes on the checklist. So by nature, not everybody does that. So you're going to be cold calling people that are non-ideal. You're going to be cold calling people that maybe aren't the best fit. That's fine. But if we can mitigate that and we can ensure that more often than not, you are calling your ideal client, you're going to get more appointments, you're going to get more face time, and because of that, you're going to eventually close more business. So I want to focus on this notion of an ideal client. What is it? What does it mean? And how do I identify it when I spot it? So an ideal client should meet two criteria. If yours do not meet these two criteria, I hate to tell you, they're not ideal clients. Number one is 10 times out of 10, this ideal client needs you. Now again, your ideal client might be a person. Perhaps you're selling life insurance to an individual. Your ideal client might be an organization. Perhaps you're selling CRM services or group life insurance or you're a company that helps organizations move when they change locations. Either way, your ideal client 10 times out of 10 needs you. Now here's the thing. They may know they need you or they may have no clue that they need you. But at the end of the day, we know they need you. So with that being said, we've got to take a close examination of the services that we provide. We need to take a look at under what circumstances do clients need us, under what, uh, what might be going on with that individual or organization where there's more of an urgent need for what we do. And if we can call this entity at a time where the need for our services goes up, now we're not selling but rather facilitating and the odds of a, a successful outcome are more prevalent than not. And that second bullet point that you see on the slide is what I work with my clients on to identify in terms of a timing mechanism, and I call that life events. Life events do three things. Number one is they create urgency. Number two is they change perspective. And number three is they modify behavior. So let me give you one quick example. Let's say I am selling CRM solutions to an organization one of the life events that I might pick for that organization is a new CEO. Because if they have a new CEO, that person is not stuck in the old ways of the company. That person wants to make his or her mark on the organization, and that person is probably open to new ideas and a new way of doing things. So if I just so happen to be calling the organization shortly after a new CEO takes his or her place at the head of the table, my odds of success might go up. If you're an individual, maybe a life event might be marriage. If I'm selling life insurance, going after individuals that are recently married might be conducive to a successful meeting and the need for additional life insurance. So using life events, either for individuals, using life events for organizations are a wonderful timing mechanism, but you have to know what events your individual or organization might be going through where the needs for your services go up. So our ability to identify that will certainly make a lot of sense. So not only 10 times out of 10 does your ideal client need you, but also number two is not when, because I, I have a feeling that the people on this call are certainly capable of doing it, but or not if, I should say, but when, when you close that business, it's going to pay you well. Now, we're all on this call for the right reason. We all do what we do for the right reasons. We're good people that want to touch lives, that want to help people through a problem, and that want to make the world a better place. We all understand that. There's no question about that. But is there anything wrong with getting paid well in what we do? Is there anything wrong with going after high-quality business that's going to help our organization reach their bottom line? Is there anything wrong with us hitting our annual goal by April? I don't think so, and I think it's foolish to put an emphasis on quantity over quality, especially when it relates to cold calling. So the business that we close with this individual or organization should pay us well. Now, at the end of this slide, you'll see two bullet points. So just a quick, re, uh, a quick tangent here. When I was in financial services, which I was for nearly three years, when I first started that, I thought it was the best gig in the world. What a blessing it was. If you were going to die... You needed life insurance. Well, that's about 8 billion potential clients. Okay, great. If you've got a pulse, I'm going after you. If you fog up a mirror, I'm going after you. The second thing is, not only is if you're going to die, do you need life insurance, but if you use money, 
rely on money, want to retire on money, and want to make sure that you don't outlive your money, you probably need a good plan. Well, outside of selling life insurance, I also did investments. Everybody on the planet basically needed my services. What I thought was a blessing, however, quickly became evident that it was more of a curse because if everybody needs me, everybody for the most part is agreeing to meet with me. So I'm working 18 hour days. I had to put name tags on my boys two and four because I was forgetting their names when I came home. I was eating licorice and uh, juji fruits before I went to bed because that's all the time I had for. I was writing a lot of business but it was not paying me very well so I was actually falling further and further behind and what happened was because just about anybody could benefit from what I did, I was chasing everybody. I wasn't being disciplined, I wasn't being focused, I wasn't being discriminating in a good way about who I should be going after and why. So what I want us to make sure is if we're not disciplined with who we go after, if we don't time our cold calls effectively to correspond around life events, if we're calling individuals and organizations that don't have a need for what we do, guess what guys? Cold calling becomes a numbers game. Cold calling becomes non-strategic. Cold calling becomes a total, a, a, basically a total example in random chance and coincidence, and I don't want us to go through that. I want us to have a good idea of who our ideal client is, what makes them ideal, ensuring that they need us, ensuring that if we get their business, it's going to pay us well, and setting the stage so that we just so happen to appear in the right place at the right time with the right value add in a manner that's going to bring value to them in some capacity. So your ideal client should meet those two criteria. What I want to do now is because for some individuals and organizations this is an entirely new way of thinking, I want to walk you through the profile of my ideal client when I was in financial services. But first, before I can do that, I need to share with you how do we describe an ideal client. Fine, an ideal client is somebody that needs me. Thanks, Captain Obvious. An ideal client is somebody that's going to pay me well. Geez, I'm taking 45 minutes to listen to this knucklehead tell me that. What a rip. No, that's not all what we're going to be talking about. But if we're going to be describing who our ideal client is, how could you articulate who your ideal client is to somebody that's not a member of your organization? If I don't work for your company, I don't know the services that you provide, I don't know what makes you special and unique, how can you quickly, coherently, and impactfully articulate who your ideal client is to somebody that has no idea what you do. Here's how. Your ideal client should be described in a minimum of six, maximum of nine criteria. The criteria should be specific and the criteria should be quantifiable. Let me give you an example for each. So if I'm in financial advising and I'm licensed to sell life insurance but I'm only licensed in the state of Wisconsin, one specific piece of criteria might be this individual has to be a resident of Wisconsin. Pretty straightforward. That's specific criteria. Quantifiable might be I only want to work with individuals that have a household income north of $100,000 per year. Again, that's quantifiable. I can readily ascertain if this person is an ideal client or less than ideal client based on the fact that this guy doesn't live in Wisconsin or this guy only makes $45,000 a year. You have to be specific, you have to be quantifiable. I love realtors. The vast majority of my clients are realtors, but I get a kick out of realtors because realtors struggle with this. When I ask my realtors when I first get going with them, describe your ideal client, they'll say, well, people that are nice. Wonderful. Where in the white pages are the nice people listed? I haven't seen anybody walking down my block with a big pink button that says, I'm nice. Or somebody that says, well, I want somebody that values me. Again, if I'm an unknown commodity to this person, where am I going to find who the people that value me are? If it's specific, we can know it in advance. If it's quantifiable, we can know it in advance. And we're not randomly calling through the white pages or our church directory trying to find the nice people that will value us. So again, what I want to do is because this is a new way of thinking, I want to share with you what my ideal client was when I was in financial services, give you a concrete example, and then challenge everybody on this call to go back and do this with your team and see if you can do something similar to put yourself in a position to be successful. 
So I am cognizant of the fact that there are probably some women on this call. I am cognizant of the fact that in this very PC environment we live in, I don't want to step on any toes. I love women. I'm married. I've got a lot of female friends. I am not a sexist, I assure you. But my number one ideal client to get this going was that I was going after a man. So because everybody's on mute only, you're, you're not going to be able to weigh in and give me your thoughts on this, but just pause for quiet reflection for a moment. Why do you think Paul Newberger, the financial advisor, was going after guys as an ideal client? Some, com some common responses that you get are this. Well, perhaps, again, I'm painting with a broad brush, perhaps the man makes more money, so he'd be the guy to go to. Perhaps the male makes the financial decisions in the household, so maybe he would be the guy to go to. Some people even say, well, men on the mortality table die quicker. So maybe that guy has more of a need to get his affairs in order. That might all make sense. And the more outside the box original ideas that you can come up with, the better, because it forces you to think creatively. But in terms of my experience, this is why I did this. The guys usually walked into my office, a gigantic stack of papers in hand, some facing up, some facing down, some going forward, some going backward, all bound together by this teeny tiny paper clip that I figured would explode at any moment. He'd drop it on my desk. He'd say, I've been sitting on this for nine years. Tell me what to do. i got to go watch the Packers buy. Well, that was fine for me because I, did, I wanted the autonomy to create somebody's comprehensive plan. I wanted the freedom to look this over and come up with my analysis. Again, I'm stereotyping here, but more often than not, the women that I worked with were a little bit more hands-on. Paul, I see you went from mutual fund A to mutual fund B. Why? Paul, the Dow Jones just went down one-tenth of one percent. What do we do? Again, I'm painting with a broad brush, but I wanted somebody that would give me the autonomy that I wanted. So for me, a male was an ideal client. That was criteria number one. Criteria number two, and if you'll notice on the bottom of these slides now. I'm keeping a running tally so everybody can keep score at home in case you're doing so. Criteria number two is this male was between the ages of 45 and 60. Why do you think I was targeting men between the ages of 45 and 60? I'll give you a couple of reasons. One is this guy is probably entering his peak earning years. If I wait two or three more years, it probably will not make much of a difference. If he's 23, he's got an awful lot, long way to go before he's making the kind of top dollars that he will at some later point. So I'd, waiting much longer isn't going to matter. He's at peak earning years. Number two is probably even by accident, this guy has started to accumulate stuff old 401ks, investments that have been sitting there, things that maybe his family gifted him. So he's got some stuff to work with. But number three was the primary reason for doing this. This guy has the secret sauce on his side, and this guy has this going on, which is going to make it more opportunistic for me, and that's this. Motivation. If he's 50 years old and he might be retiring in 10 years, and if he hasn't done anything, this guy is highly motivated. He probably knows he needs a financial advisor. I don't have to sell him on that. He probably knows he needs to get his affairs in order. I don't have to convince him of that. So now I'm not selling this guy, but rather facilitating working with me. And because I'm a self-confident guy, the only reason he's not working with me is because he hasn't met me yet. And that's true with a lot of your clients as well. Number three is where we start getting a little bit more fun here, start thinking outside the box and start really positioning ourselves to be in the right place at the right time, and that's this. My 45 to 60-year-old male was right smack dab in the middle of a divorce, right in the middle of it. This wasn't pre-divorce where he and his spouse aren't getting along and they don't know how much longer they're going to last. This isn't after the fact where they look back after the 12 months that were and say, whew, Glad that train wreck is over with. He has an attorney. She has an attorney. They're going to go to court in about a month to finalize this divorce. Why in the heck would I want to parachute into that firestorm, do you think? Because this was my life event. This was the life event that I introduced you to earlier. This was the personal life event where the need for my services went up, that modified perspective, and it changed behavior. This guy's in the middle of a divorce. Now, I reside in Wisconsin. Wisconsin's a marital property state. 
unless you have a prenuptial agreement, unless you have any other kind of legally binding contract before you enter into marriage, what's yours is hers and what's hers is yours. I mean, that's just the way that it works here. If all of a sudden you've been dreaming together, saving together, planning together, talking together, now all of a sudden the baby's split in half, there's two big issues here. One is, am I going to have enough income on my own to sustain my quality of life? Well, who can answer that? A financial advisor. Option number two is, wait a minute, look at this guy's age, 50 years old, let's say. He might have been married for 25 years. That's a long time to be planning together, saving together, dreaming together. Now all of a sudden, everything is upended. Am I going to be able to retire at the age that I wanted in the manner that I wanted? Who can advise me on that? A financial advisor. And the last thing I think is the most... the the. I don't want to. I don't want to make this sound bad. Nobody wants anybody to go through a divorce, but but it happens. Six out of ten couples are going through this. One of the things that was beneficial in this process is that this was a life event that had an end date. Now, granted, sometimes you go to court, you can't come to an agreement, so it gets pushed off a little bit. Uh, otherwise, maybe one spouse is ready to go, the other spouse says, "You know what? I'm not ready to do this," so it might be delayed a little bit. But for the most part, we know. We're going to go to court on November 7th and finalize this thing. My sale was in sight. There was a finite timeline for when this transaction could take place, and both parties are incredibly have this incredible sense of urgency to do what they need to do to be prepared by that date. All of that works out well for the services that I provide. If you can find a life event that has a definitive end date, if you can find a life event that has a finite amount of time before between now and its conclusion, that is the gold standard life event that you're really going to want to focus on. Item number four, we're, all, we're moving right through this thing. My 45 to 60 year old male who is right smack in the middle of a divorce, this guy, once the divorce is all said and done, is going to be receiving at a minimum $1 million in investable assets from said divorce. Once the house is sold, once the liquid savings is divvied up, once the 401ks are disseminated, his share is going to be at least a million bucks. Why do you think I chose that? And it's not some kind of secret that only financial advisors know about. Like maybe that's the minimum of a super spectacular investment. No, quite frankly, the reason I picked this one is answer number two to my ideal client profile. This, this is a case that is going to pay me very very well and if I can do 10 million dollar cases I'm gonna make more money than if I did 100 ten thousand dollar cases or some kind of iteration thereof again to emphasize this does not mean that individuals that have less than a million dollars aren't worth my time of course they are this does not mean that they're any less important or any less human if you are feeling that or hearing that you're missing the point my point is if I'm gonna be researching people anyway if I'm gonna be cold calling people anyway if I'm then gonna be running appointments anyway if I'm then gonna be running those appointments and trying to bring them through to some kind of a successful sale anyway I might as well optimize efficiency optimize quality and put myself in the right place at the right time not only does this case pay me well this guy's got a lot to lose he has a tremendous amount to lose. Maybe his wife was handling the finances and this guy knows nothing about investments or financial services. Well, with all that money he's going to be getting, he cannot afford not to be prepared. Enter Paul Newberger, the financial advisor. My ads of success go up markedly. Item number five out of six. We're almost there. Item number five is this 45 to 60 year old male right in the middle of a divorce who's going to get at least a million bucks in investable assets from that life event resides within 15 miles of my office. Why would I limit myself to 15 miles, do you think? There's really two reasons for this. Number one is it's, it's convenience. Convenience for both parties, but I'll be selfish on this one and say convenience for myself. And why I mean that is this is not the only appointment I've got to run today. All my eggs are not in this business strategy. I still get people that walk into my office. I still get people that call me on the phone. I still get referrals. I cannot spend all day every day working on this one case. Now, if I've got to schlep 150 miles up to northern Wisconsin and back and forth every single day, I'm, that's going to drastically limit the amount of appointments I can run. If he's local, I can meet him and still have time for other appointments. The second one is, 
it's it's obvious for anybody that's gone through this in their lives divorce is an emotionally traumatic time my friends are her friends my family is her family well what happens if everybody sides with her and I get the cold shoulder from everyone everyone in my life now is basically gone well here's a financial advisor that's helping me here's a financial advisor that's listening to me here's a financial advisor that is giving his time to try to help me through this very traumatic time it allows me the opportunity to build a rapport with this guy, to bond with this this guy, and keep that relationship process going in an effort to build trust and friendship. I think it's good to build relational relationships in business. A lot of my former clients to this day are still my friends, and they've been a tremendous blessing in my life, all because I can spend time with them, getting to know them, and building rapport. Last but not least, this male has changed his job at least twice in the last 25 years. If he's been with the same employer for the last quarter century, less than ideal. Now if he's been with five different employers in 25 years, even better yet. Why do you think I came up with this as a ideal client criteria? Now people do get this, but this one is a little bit more inside baseball as it pertains to being a financial advisor. Has everybody on the call heard of a little concept called rollovers? Well, that's kind of where I'm going at. When you change your employer, when you change jobs, more often than not, it is in your best interest to take your 401k out of there. I'm no longer working there, yet they're making investment decisions. I no longer talk to anybody at that organization yet they're making all the financial decisions on my hard-earned money. It doesn't make a lot of sense to keep your old investments with your old employers. So not only is it in the best interest of the individual to potentially roll that over, but depending on the rollover, it can actually be quite lucrative for a financial advisor also. So this is another value add that I can provide. This is another need that I can address. And this is another piece of low-hanging fruit that's going to make this case even sweeter than it already is. So what I want you to do is I want you to take a quick look at my criteria. Ask yourself two questions. One is everything specific and number two is everything quantifiable. Mail is a yes or no question. You can't really quantify that. Divorce is a yes or no question. You can't really quantify that. But look at everything else. My challenge to everybody on the call is if you cannot create a list of six to nine specific quantifiable criteria to describe your ideal client, you're going to be making too many bad cold calls. You're going to be reaching too many people that do not need you. You're going to be contacting too many people that have no need for your services at the present time. That's going to make cold calling more difficult. That's going to hurt your confidence and that of your sales team. And that's going to make it a steeper climb to get good at this in a truncated amount of time. But just again, look at my list. Do you think if I called this guy out of the blue, he recognizes he needs a good financial advisor? Do you think he's thought at least once about what to do with my investments at this point in my life? Do you think he's got a little stress going on in terms of where he is right now? And if you've answered yes to all three of those, which I'm assuming you are, if I get in front of this guy and if he elects to bless me with his business, do you think this is a piece of business that's going to pay me well? My friends, cold calling is, qual is quality over quantity. Cold calling is putting an emphasis on strategy and forgetting randomness. The reason, and I'm going to leave you with my contact information, but if you look at my website, the reason I've got such a high cold call success rate and the reason that my clients do too is we go into the cold call with just about all the answers to the test. We go into the cold call with an incredible amount of strategy, with an incredible amount of proactive guidance and forward thinking, that for the most part we're in the right place at the right time. Now, I'm also a human being and I know that I'm not perfect, far from it. Look at this list. What challenges am I going to face if this is my list of ideal client criteria? The biggest challenge that I'm going to face is exactly what I shared with you earlier when I was mocking the nice guys, when I was mocking those people that value the services that my realtors provide. Where in the heck am I going to find this guy? Again, to use the same examples, I don't think they list 
middle-aged men who are right in the middle of the, the divorce of a divorce in the white pages or yellow pages or whatever pages they use that nobody uses anymore. I don't believe that individuals that are going through this time in their life like to proactively advertise it by wearing sashes or buttons or tattooing this on their forehead. This is going to be extremely difficult for me to find. But here's one thing that I'm so glad I never sacrificed on. What I, what I never sacrificed on is this. I knew this guy, if I could get in front of him, I knew he needed me. I knew that if I could get in front of this guy and, and show him that I am worthy of his business, it was going to pay me well. And I was also aware, because I'm a Christian guy, I was also aware that I could help this person in a tremendous time of need because I've got the discipline, the wherewithal, and the professionalism to see this through. But again, I, I had no idea where I was going to find this guy. So I was faced with two options. Option number one is I could have watered down my list. I could have said, you know, he doesn't have to be going through a divorce. He could be happily married. That's fine. You know, he doesn't have to have a million dollars in investable assets. That is a lot of money after all. Even if he's got $250,000, that's perfectly permissible for me. I could live with that. Think about yourself personally and professionally. Has anything good come out of your life when you've lowered the bar? Now, my wife will tell you she married me by lowering the bar, so maybe that's one good example. But outside of that, I can't think of anything that has come out of my life in a positive, good manner by me settling for less. So I refused to settle for less. And what I did is I came up with this term called centers of influence. As Andy so articulately pointed out, I was not an overnight success. I'm, I'm making this look very easy right now as I zip through this. But it took months of sleepless nights, months of failure, months of beating my head against the wall, and I've got the dents in my drywall to prove it. But for me, I finally started to think, if I can't figure out who these individuals are, maybe I can think of where do these individuals congregate. So I came up with this, a center of influence. A center of influence by Paul Newberger's definition is this. It's an organization, an entity, or a professional who is around my ideal client all day, every day. It's on your screen, but I'll say it again. An organization, entity, or professional who is around your ideal client all day, every day. So think of my list. A 45 to 60-year-old male right in the middle of a divorce has got at least a million bucks in investable assets, resides within 15 miles of my office, and has changed his job at least twice in the last quarter century. Which organization, entity, or professional, pray tell, is around a guy that meets those criteria, for the most part, all day, every day. This is where the rubber meets the road. These, This is a short list of my COIs. I could have gone on and on and on, because if you really think about it, there's quite a lot with the particular life event that I picked. Divorce attorneys, that's what everybody comes up with right away. They're not advocates for divorce, they facilitate divorce. All day, every day, divorce attorneys are around people that go through a divorce. Might it make sense for me to cold call them to try to get referrals? Absolutely. Marriage counselors, pastors and priests, bartenders, usually gets a laugh, but if you think about it, probably true. Realtors, CPAs, mental health professionals, physical fitness centers. The more outside the box you can be, the more creative you can be, you're going to start locking out your competition. You're going to be one of the few people in your profession reaching out to the COIs. And the key to COI success is building your COIs around the life event that you choose. Now, remember, my life event was divorce. Would any of these COIs be on the list if I chose marriage? Would any of these COIs be on my list if I chose birth of a child, death of a spouse, loss of a job? Maybe, but most often, but more often than not, the answer is no. There are so many professions out there today. I know this is common sense, but there are so many professions out there today that are just predicated on life events. If you're never going to die, you don't need a funeral home director. If you're never going to buy or sell real estate, you don't need a realtor. If you're never going to get married, you don't need a wedding planner. These people live and die by life events. Once you pick your life event, ask yourself, 
what types of organizations, entities, or professionals are around that life event all day, every day, and they should form the second stool of this cold call program. What I found is on this list, of all these bullet points, do you know who turned out to be the worst source of referrals for me? It might shock you. Divorce attorneys. They were the absolute worst. Do you know who the best was? Marriage counselors. And let me tell you why. And I never would have known this if I didn't cold call divorce attorneys and start running appointments. By the time couples contact a divorce attorney, they're fairly certain that this marriage is over. They're fairly certain that they're going to go this route. Well, if my wife and I are pretty fairly certain that we're going to end the marriage, we're also intelligent people. We're probably having other conversations on the side. Usually that includes a conversation with a financial advisor. By the time they got to the divorce attorney, they usually already had a financial advisor. Marriage counselors, however, turned out to be the best source of referrals for me because with marriage counseling, there's a fact that there's a chance we can still save this marriage. You're not as far along in the process as you are with a divorce attorney, so they're not talking to as many people. They're not seeking as much outside professional guidance. And if it is determined that a divorce is imminent, the marriage counselor was in a prime position to refer me out to their clients. I wonder who this relates to on your side. So to put a, put a kind of bow on this thing, I believe the secret to cold call success is a stool with really two parts. The first one is you should be cold calling your ideal clients for the reasons that I said earlier. Ideal clients need you. Ideal clients are going to pay you well. And ideal clients can go from a prospect to close business pretty darn quickly. If you can identify the ideal clients, start with those. For those of you that are targeting organizations, it is going to be much easier for you to identify your ideal clients than an individual or an organization that's trying to get in front of uh, respective individuals. So if you can identify your ideal clients, start with them because that's the low-hanging fruit. But even if you can identify your ideal clients, please don't put all your eggs in that basket. We want to optimize efficiency, we want to optimize effectiveness, and a way to do that is by also cold calling centers of influence. If you're targeting individuals, it is going to be tough. If you're a realtor, financial advisor, if you're an attorney, if you're a banker, it's going to be tough to find all six criteria before you make the call. So if you're going after individuals, centers of influences usually takes more predominance, usually is a bigger part of your program. And as I said earlier, the best COIs are based on life events. So before you pick up the phone, before you come up with what you think is the gold standard script, before you spend all of this time figuring out the right thing to say, please make sure that you can identify your ideal client, that you can describe him, her, or if it's an organization, it, in six to nine specific quantifiable criteria. Settle on one life event as part of those six specific quantifiable criteria and come up with a handful of centers of influence who make their living around that life event, who are around entities that are going through that life event, and for the love of God, cold call both. You're going to find you're going to get in front of more people, you're going to run more appointments, and you're going to close a lot more business because you're optimizing efficiency and effectiveness. It's been a privilege to speak with you here today. Thank you so much for giving me the time that you have. I, I know that no gift is better than the gift of time. This is 45 minutes you'll never get back, which I hope isn't a bad thing. But at the end of the day, I really do appreciate it. I hope this isn't the last time we talk. If you want any additional information about Paul Newberger, about the cold call coach, about the success stories that our clients have put up over the past year plus, here is all my contact information. I would love to stay in touch. I would love to answer any questions that you have. You've got my email address, you've got our office phone number, and you've got my website. So with that, I'm going to turn it back to Andy to see if we have any particular questions in the hopper. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, we actually do. we got a couple of questions here for you. The first one is, what do you do if you do not have enough individuals or organizations to choose from once you establish your ideal client criteria? You party. Because that means that's fewer <laughs> cold calls that you have to make. No, I'm 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 teasing. Uh, uh, but what I'm teasing, but I'm not. I'm teasing in the sense that, of course, if there's nobody to call, that's a problem. 
but I don't want you to base cold calling on quantity over quality. I can't stress that enough. I'm different. I'm the first one uh, that I can find that proactively advocates that cold calling is not a numbers game. Everybody tells you it is. You've got to make a thousand phone calls before you can get 50 appointments. That, that, that's hogwash. My clients will make 50 appointments and 75 calls because we are much more strategic. So I don't want you to be upset or scared if you say, man, I've only got two dozen organizations to choose from. Be happy with that because you now only have to make two dozen calls and run two dozen appointments. But if you go, to, if you go through that list and you say, I've got one person on the list, that can be a problem. So slowly start scaling back. Maybe you say, okay, 15 mile radius, that's a little too close, let's go back to 30 miles. Does that alleviate any problems? Does that bring a few more people in? If it doesn't bring enough in, in my case, maybe I'll say, all right, maybe 45 to 60 is too restrictive. I'm going to look at 40 to 65. Maybe that brings in a few more people. So what I would say is if your prospect list is very light, slowly start scaling back until you get to a number that you're happy with. Please don't blow up your ideal client criteria right off the bat and say, okay, forget divorce, let's go marriage. Slowly step back, slowly peel the layer back and get that to a number that you're happy with and then cold call. Awesome. Thanks, Paul. Uh, the second question here is how do you get the centers of influence to turn their referrals over to you? Well, that's a great question. And I have no real obvious answer to that outside of, I would say, whoever asked that question, how do you get your clients to buy from you? How do you get people to meet with you? Why do people like you and, and find value in your, your services? Why do your friends like you? Or why does your family enjoy spending time with you? I would say that's how we're going to do that because at the end of the day, life is about value add. Now, if we're going to be meeting with all these divorce attorneys, if I'm going to get them to send their referrals to me, what do I have to do? Well, I probably have to establish credibility. I probably have to be professional. I probably have to show them that I can take good care of their clients. And I should probably also be in a position to send value to them. As a financial advisor, might some of my clients go through a divorce at some point? Sure. So could I bring that up to the divorce attorney and say, look, we're going after the same person. Are we not? That, I think, is one of the most profound answers to that question is your COIs. I mean, let's just look at this. The divorce attorney. Who's the divorce attorney going after? People that determine that a divorce is necessary. Who am I going after? People that determine a divorce is necessary. So if I can stomach her and she can stomach me, we feel each person respective person is a good representative of each other we're going after the same people perhaps we can collaborate perhaps we can send referrals back and forth perhaps we can be on the lookout for each other and if we're entering into those types of creative agreements or those types of strategy conversations our odds of success go up but my point being is I never would have had that conversation anyway if I didn't cold call to try to get that appointment Awesome. All right. Thanks, Paul. What a great presentation. We appreciate you joining us. I can see now why so many companies and individuals are bringing you on board to work with their sales teams. Um, great stuff. Just as a reminder to everyone, you will receive an email following the presentation that's going to have a link to access the presentation on demand. And again, encourage you to share that with others that will find it beneficial. Um, Paul did a great job on that. So I also wanted to let you know about an exciting webinar we have coming up next Thursday, so a week from today. That's going to be marketing automation for CRM. What's the difference? So in this 30-minute webinar, we're going to examine the core competencies of marketing automation for CRM platforms like Salesforce, Microsoft Dynamics CRM, Sugar, and others. And we're going to focus on the strengths of each, defining their differences, but also discuss how these tools work together to help marketers achieve their business goals. So there's going to be a link to this webinar in that on-demand email later today. So be sure to look into that and also register if you want to attend. From all of us here at Legacy Partners, we want to thank Paul for presenting with us today. And we also want to thank all of you for joining us. Have a great rest of your day and a wonderful weekend.